that's where you formed, and how'd you get the name? Well, how we... I think we got together simply because, um... I mean, I, do you remember the times of, uh, you know, the new wave of British heavy metal, you know, Iron Maiden, Sex oh, yeah. Trump, and all those bands? Well, see, I've been following you guys since you started, so... Right, well, then you should know, but I mean, okay. But this is for people in America that don't have a clue. <clears throat> we were just three assholes kicked out of school. We were like 15, 16 or something. And um, we got together simply... Basically, because one of the guy's fathers was very rich, so we could all, all you know, all the time offer uh, some place where we could rehearse. You know, we owned a lot, a lot of houses, and there was always, you know, a cellar or a basement somewhere where, where we could rehearse. So, basically, that was one of the reasons why he remained in the band. <laughs> <laughs> and the original lineup stayed together for about a year. And the only thing that we recorded with the original lineup was the two tracks for that compilation album, given in the Latinx. Mm -hmm in January 1984. And as far as the name's concerned, um, I must have been about 14 or something, 13, 14, when I read a book about uh, people like, you know, Dracula, uh, what was it, Alice McCrowley, um, you know, and all those strange people. And Elizabeth Bathory was, was in there as well. And Bathory was uh, a very good name, simply because it was neutral. I mean, I must have said this a million times before. Uh, if you called your band Satan's Venus, mm -hmm. you were bound to have people put labels on you straight from the start. But Bathory was such a neutral name. Mm -hmm. uh, it would have been very difficult for anybody to actually put a label on us simply because of the name, or the band's name. Um, yeah, if people actually wanted to have a story, there was a great story to tell uh, as far as the name of the band was concerned because she was more or less like the, the female version of Dracula. Mm -hmm. And you couldn't call your band Dracula because it was he was too uh, there was too much of a Hollywood feeling to his name. And there was a very special thing uh, about her because she was a woman. I mean, very unusual. Actually, we had a lot of different names in the beginning. Nosferatu was one. <laughs> okay. Um, who is the current lineup for Bathory? Oh, the current lineup has been is the same lineup that's been together for eight years now. Me and a friend of mine, I play the guitar and the bass, and I'm a friend of mine who comes in two weeks a year, probably, or one week a year, playing the drums, only when we record the basic tracks. And that's been the situation for eight years now. So there's not a bad situation. Hmm. And it hasn't been for eight years. Um, when you do get together, or do you do live shows at all? or? Oh, the last time we stood on the stage was in February 1985. Wow. That was 11 years ago. That's a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> um, I heard a rumor that you played everything on the first three records. No. No? I played half of the bass on the second album. On the third album, uh, I mean, on the first album, I played the guitar and I did the vocals. And I had two friends of mine. Actually, they were brothers. And they were in a, in a different band, so they were never sort of like a part of the band. Actually, when the first lineup had split up, basically because they were into, you know, bands like White Snake and Iron Maiden and asked me to, to write that kind of material. We went separate ways. Uh, I mean, we were nobodies in those days anyway, so who, who the hell cared about the original line, lineup splitting up? Uh, but then um, the record company uh, that had put out the first compilation album in early 84 called me and said, like, hey guys, you, you, you got to get together to record an album. Because um, we were the only band on that compilation album. I think there were five or six bands on that album. Uh, we were the only band to receive fan mail. And only at that time we realized that there was something happening in Europe. I mean, the underground scene and everything. Um, and, I mean, I didn't want those two guys in the band anymore. I mean, I'd progressed and everything, become more brutal and everything. Mm -hmm. So I got together with two friends of mine. They were playing a punk band here in Stockholm. And they were not into heavy metal or any of that kind of bullshit at all. They were into punk. And I've been playing in punk bands prior to Bathory as well, uh, since I was 12, I think. Um, so I, I sort of like just um, told these guys, hey, why don't we just like team up in the studio and we record an album? And we rehearsed for about six hours and they recorded an album in 30 hours, including mixing and sound check and everything. So in 36 hours, we had the first album together. It was just for fun, more or less. We had no ambitions whatsoever. We had no clue. 
Now, on the first three records, they, they had like a, a satanic theme to them. And then I noticed on Hammerheart, you switched, or Bloodfire Death, you switched to um, uh, Nordic mythology. Is there a reason for the change? Or? Well, it's very easy to just simplify the whole thing by just calling it either satanic or, or Norse or, or Viking mythology you know, type of album. Um, I think the truth is more complicated than that. I think one of the reasons why we picked up the whole satanic issue was basically because each and every one of us in the band at that time had been growing up listening to Black Sabbath. And, um, I mean, that was the base for everything. I mean, the, the, the lyrics and the atmosphere of Black Sabbath, the sound of Motorhead and the appearance of Kiss, I mean, that, that was it. I mean, there you have it. I mean, you don't really need much more than that. Mm -hmm. um, so we didn't, you know, try to make any statement or anything like that. I mean, we had no clue as far as Satanism was concerned. I mean, we were so innocent. And as far as the lyrics are concerned, on the first two albums at least, that was just like horror stories. Mm -hmm. Um we didn't have, you know, we knew shit about Satanism or anything, you know, the occult and everything. And um, on the third album, I all of a sudden realized, hey, come on, I mean, this is our third album. Um, why don't we just try to do something a little bit different? So most of the songs on that album was recorded or written on, on, on an acoustic guitar. And I got hooked on classical music, basically because uh, the drummer in the band at the time was uh, taught in classical music. And I played a lot of classical music. So um, there was a change already there in the music. I mean, thinking how to arrange your music and everything. And we started to think about different things than the underground and, you know, hell and stuff like that, because everybody else was doing it at the time. Mm -hmm. it, also, the music um, on the first three were were real fast and, and brutal, and then you got slower and longer. <laughs> what, what was the reason for that? We got older. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I mean... Once, once you're in the position, you, you, you're actually allowed to record albums. And as a songwriter, I mean, if you're a, if you're a cook or, or, or you make a living as, as a prostitute or, I mean, anything, I mean, after a couple of years, you get really bored with, you know, just giving a blowjob or, or, or making spaghetti every day. So you try to do things a little bit different. And especially since, you know, if you're a recording artist, I mean, when you write songs, it's a, it's a greater challenge to actually try out new sounds and new ideas and new tempos and, and topics for your lyrics and everything. Mm -hmm. So, uh, um, I think it's just natural. I don't think you're sitting down actually trying to analyze what you're about to do when, you, when you're when you in the studio, but um, I mean, things just come natural. Mm -hmm. We were sort of like trying to find uh, an image or a sound that was going to separate us from, from the from the rest or anything like that. Um, it just became natural. I mean, I'm sure if we, we would have been in a New York-based band and we had to, to play in clubs and, and, and do that whole date thing uh, to survive, it would have been a completely different matter. But mm -hmm. now, only having to record an album a year to still survive, not having to do videos or concerts or put up with great line merchandise, merchandise or anything like that. Mm -hmm. If you're just recording an album every 20 months or something like that, you um, you change. I mean, you don't live from the edge of the knife, sort of like. Mm -hmm. um, you can change and still survive. Here it is, uh, 10 years, 10 or so years later, and you're 14. still... 14. And you're still doing Bathory. How do you explain the longevity? Um, well, like I said, if, if there would have been a, a band situation, there would have been three or four different minds, you know, um, sort of like wanting different, wanting different things with the band. And um, there's, a, there's a whole different situation when bands need to go out to play concerts to do tours and videos and things like that. And when you're tied in with a record company that puts, you know, the band in the position where you have to make a certain type of a record. I mean, just look at Metallica, you know, they have guys coming in down, down the studio wearing suit and ties and telling those guys how to sound, you know. Um, we would never want to end up in that kind of situation. So um, why we're still around after 14 years, I don't know. Because, I mean, we're neither better or faster or greater or anything, uh, you know, any, than any other band. I mean, if the first Bathory album or the first Venom album or the first Slayer album would have been released today, none of, you know, nobody would have cared because those albums were not great albums compared to what's coming out today. Mm -hmm. But they were special albums in those days. I mean, you have to put everything into its right time window, so to speak. Mm -hmm. What made you put out a solo album? Um, we recorded an album in 1990, I believe, called Twilight of the Gods. 
And at that point, I realized we'd become very, very, very much arranged. I mean, our music. And um, it was so far away from the street stuff that we'd been, you know, dealing with on, uh, on the first couple of albums. Um, so we more or less just painted ourselves into a corner. And it was very, very, it was a very, very difficult thing to, to take us out of there because, um, I mean, we were just, um, at the time, we were big drums, um, a lot of echoes, 16 tracks of harmony vocals and sound effects and everything, and that's what people wanted. But after some time, it becomes very, very boring. So actually, I just laid battery on ice for two years. I didn't even touch the guitar. I mean, there you have it. I mean, for me not to touch my guitar for two years, that's amazing. And then people just said, like, okay, even though you cannot write material for Bathory Gate, you don't know what you want to do with band, um, and you're not even bothering about, you know, getting a bass player for the band. Um, um, I was actually talking with the idea of cutting my hair, trying to get in, uh, some kind of an education, academy ex education and stuff. Um, they said, like, why don't you enter the studio to record a solo album? I mean, just do anything and keep yourself alive as a musician and a songwriter. So I just went in there bringing a guitar and a bass and a drum machine. And for three days, we just had great fun. And if that thing hadn't happened, then the battery wouldn't be no more. It was just sort of like a lot of, a, a lot of steam, frustration, and to have fun. And find yourself as a guitar player and, and a musician. Not that anything that we've done with battery after that has been close to the solo album, but it was, um, it was the rescue, I mean, what's the English word? Um, it sort of like saved battery. Mm. Um, who are some of your musical influences? Oh, <clears throat> I know it sounds very, very, very strange, but out of everything that that you get to hear um, on the radio and everything, I mean, the core of what you're actually playing on, on, on CDs at home, I mean, there's still Beethoven, Wagner, Mountain, uh, Led Zeppelin, Early Cues, Early Sabbath, Motorhead, early Motorhead, um, anything else, um, did I say the Beatles, yeah, I'm sure I said the Beatles, Pistols, I mean, stuff that's, I mean, none of that stuff is, is younger than, you know, 15 years, mm -hmm. so, um, not that, that means that everything that's been released for the last 15 years has been bullshit, but, um, I guess that's what, what's actually influencing you as a musician and, and a person still today. Um, is Corson your real name? Oh, no, absolutely not. <laughs> we picked those names simply because at the time there was a... Do you remember these, the Swedish band Europe? Oh, yeah. Um, they were sort of like number one in Sweden at the time. Or, had been, you know, that was the first... Swedish rock band or a hard rock band that was actually playing on TV. We had not a single second of heavy metal on the radio or on TV, and there were no heavy metal magazines. They didn't, they, they didn't just didn't care about heavy metal in Sweden, as far as the media is concerned. And outside of Sweden, I mean in Europe, um, heavy metal was becoming number one type of music. I mean Iron Maiden, Saxon, um, and all those bands, new wave of British heavy metal. And um, Europe was very important as far as heavy metal was concerned, Sweden or hard rock or whatever you want to call it, uh, simply because they, they uh, brought the, the style of music to the, to the media. Mm -hmm. And at the time, they were very big. But the problem was they didn't use their real Swedish names. They took, you know, fake names like uh, Tempest and blah, 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 you know. And we thought, I mean, man, that's really stupid. We really should, you know, do something like that. But in the other way, we should pick names that nobody can pronounce uh, as a joke. And hopefully just, you know, stuck. Um, still today we're using those names, fake stage names, simply because it's it's a it's a joke. Um, what's the new the new album about? Well, we um I don't know if you mean the album we're in the process of recording right now or I'm in the process of recording right now or if you're thinking about Blood and Ice. Uh, Blood and Ice. Oh, blah, blah, nice. I think everything is well accounted for in the CD booklet that comes with the CD, so mm -hmm. it would take me too long time to explain what the album is all about and how it came about. Did you um, come up with the cover art, the cover art ideas? Well, I designed it and made the rough painting, so to speak, and then I had an artist who was big bathroom fan do the stuff. Mm -hmm. um, how did you get involved with the Blackmark label? Um, <coughs> uh, I think 
think in 1988 I was signed for one year to Noise Records in Germany. <coughs> and don't ask me why, but uh, there was um, <coughs> the people who worked um, in the Swedish management company for Bathory and a lot of other bands was also distributing Noise Records for Scandinavia. And at the time, uh, Noise was the kind of a label to put out just a lot of albums. They were just thinking in terms of quantity rather than quality. Mm-hmm. And um, right from start when we signed with Noise, simply because they had the, the best distribution net in Europe at the time. Not because they were such a great label, but they had the best distrib- distribution net, so you, you, could, you would make... You were absolutely sure to be in every fucking record store all across Europe at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, when we signed to them, they all of a sudden came up with a lot of ideas of how we should, you know, actually come across and what we could use on, on the album covers and stuff, and what we could not use. I mean, we have a sun wheel on the back of, of the Hammerheart album, the album that we did for noise or with noise. Mm-hmm. And in Germany, the sun wheel is a neo-Nazi symbol. And I told those guys, I don't give a fuck about 12 years of your fucking history, you are paranoid asshole Germans. The sun wheel means something completely different for, for Swedish people. The sun wheel is the symbol of life and the cycle of life. And, you know, the cycle of the sun and everything. Mm-hmm. Um, and there was a really tense relationship between a battery and noise records all throughout that one year. They gave, a no, gave us no promotion to our support whatsoever. I think they paid us 1,000 Deutsche Mark, which is about $200 for us to tour around Europe to make promotion for the album. So we wound up paying 75% of the, the costs doing the promotion in Europe ourselves, out of our, 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 our own, own pockets. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and um, at the time when noise started to um, go really bad financially, and when everybody else also realized that noise was about quantity rather than quality, Black Mark formed in Stockholm and Berlin at the same time with people from the original battery management and people who had actually uh, distributed noise in Scandinavia. And the whole idea behind Black Mark was actually to form a European label where European bands, young bands, could come up doing basically whatever kind of shit they wanted. Mm-hmm. And this should be a pure speed death black metal label. Mm. As opposed to all the big labels, you know, just signing a lot of bands and then changing their styles after one or two albums to make them sell more or whatever, you know, just seeing them as a number in a, in a catalog or, or a product. We try to keep the band's identities all throughout their time with the label. What made you cover the Kiss song on Octagon? Uh, <clears throat> when you're in the studio to, uh, to sort of like check out where to put the amplifiers and where to put your drums, uh, I mean, in the studio room to get the best sound or whatever, or to warm up, um, check the microphones and everything, um, you always record or play a lot of songs just for fun. And you can play anything from like sort of like like a virgin to the national anthem of Canada or anything like that, you know. But uh, <laughs> what we did was playing a lot of songs: Beatles, Elvis Presley, Motorhead, Sabbath, Kiss. And um, some of those songs wound up on tape because the engineer had the tape running, you know, just, just for us to check out the sound. And um, at the end of the recording, when we were working with cover art. Um, a lot of people came to me and said, hey, there are two lyrics here that you cannot use. And I said, um, okay, then we can solve this problem in two ways. Either we did not print the lyrics on the album, which sounded to be not a very good idea because some of the lyrics were very important, or we just simply have to take away those two songs because the, the songs were, I mean, the lyrics were too controversial. I knew it would hurt the band, it would hurt the label, and it would hurt a lot of people, and I wouldn't want to take their kind of responsibility, and it was a stupid way of, you know, it was just a stupid thing. So we took away two songs. Um, the album became a little short, to be called a full-length album. So um, we, we said, okay, why don't we just add a vocals to one of the rehearsal tapes when we play some covers? And we just added um, Deuce. Um, we didn't mix the, the track or anything like that, we just added vocals to a rough recording, and that was it. Um, is there a contact address for Bathory? Well, I think that there's a uh, there's an address on, on each and every CD that we ever produced. I mean, certainly when there's a Black Mark label version of our CDs, you can always find the address to Berlin or to Stockholm. Okay. Do you, do you answer all your mail? Um, it depends. If there's a mail from a 14-year-old guy somewhere in Puerto Rico who says, Hey, I love you guys. Um, can you send me uh, 58 CDs for free? Um, <laughs> I let a lot of other people take care of that. 
However, if there's a 16-year-old girl from Los Angeles sending me her used panties as a nude picture of like they used to in the early 80s, <laughs> like one of those girls, she was 22 years old, seen it from Los Angeles, she, she sent me a bag of, of, of uh, earth, um, uh, dirt, and uh, I said, like, hey, what's this all about? And she said, this is uh, dirt from a, a graveyard where I went to, um, during midnight when there was a full moon to masturbate. I thought it was going to give you some great inspiration. And that's the kind of family you want. Excellent. But yeah, I do take my time sometimes to actually sit down and um, whenever there is an, um, a very, how should I put it, um, a thorough letter, a fan letter, when, when you realize that this person is actually been thinking a lot before writing, mm -hmm. um, when, there, when there are some intelligent lines coming across. I don't bother too much about, hello, I want to buy your t-shirt, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> um, we have people taking care of that. Right.